This week on Jared Scott Outdoors, we're heading out with the fishing game. I've got my kids and we're actually gonna go out and try to help them do a deer capture. So this is one of those things that the volunteers really love to go out and do because it's so much fun. Um, it just involves a lot of people. There's a lot going on. We've got a helicopter that's gonna be driving the deer, a lot of nets and a lot of work that's gotta be done. I did it several years ago, so I'm really excited to get my kids out here to show them what it is the fishing game do with these. So anyways, we're gonna head out. I'm gonna show you all about it. Let's get after it. The day started out early in the morning at the Idaho Fishing Game office in Idaho Falls. All the volunteers and many of the Idaho Fishing Game employees gathered before first light to get some preliminary instructions and directions on where we'd be heading. Biologists in charge of the GPS collars went through each one making sure they were functioning and ready for use. Then everyone found a ride and we headed off to the location of the capture. As we waited for all the help to make it to our starting point, the helicopter that'd be bringing in the deer showed up and quickly took a reconnaissance flight to let those on the ground know where the majority of the deer were and where they felt would be the best place to set up the nets. Once the location was determined, it was time to unload all the gear needed from the trucks and load them onto some giant sleds that'd be pulled behind a couple ATVs. There were probably around 40 people here for the capture, so it was kind of fun to see all 40 of us heading on up the mountain. It was a good hike just to get close to the spot we'd be capturing deer. It took a little looking around to figure out exactly where they wanted the net set up. And we learned from here, it was a good uphill climb another quarter mile to the spot they'd located. They had some ATVs that were pulling all the hardware for this project up, nets and poles. They've gone as far as they can go, so. Now we've all had to grab a bundle and hike up the last 300 yards. It was pretty easy coming up until the ATVs and Razor couldn't get up here. And then we had to take the wood and stuff. But we're making it. Just about there. Once we all made it up to where they wanted to set up the trap, we were directed on exactly how to set up the nets and where. First the nets were laid out with the rest of us following behind using poles to stand them up. There would be one long east-west running net with four lines running north up the draws. The idea wasn't that it was up really tight, but rather that there was enough slack in the net to cushion the deer and absorb them into it. If the net's a little too tight, the deer don't get caught up as well and are able to escape at times. You'll see what I mean as we get going. With the nets up, the pilot headed off and started to round up some deer. While it was starting to round up some deer quite a ways off, we had some downtime just waiting. Meanwhile, I could see the pilot slowly getting closer and closer. Finally, when he cleared the hill above us, sure enough, there was a deer barreling through the trees below it. It was lucky to get out of that net, but there were still several other nets that it wouldn't get by so easily. When it gets to the next net, you'll see it'll be a little more careful, but it will still try to jump through it. As the deer goes down, volunteers converge on it and quickly get it subdued so that it doesn't injure itself. Meanwhile, the pilot quickly loops back around to bring in a few more deer that hung up just out of sight. While the pilot's trying to round up the other deer, those on the ground with the deer carefully back the deer out of the net so they can begin the process of collaring the deer. Everyone else stays hidden until the pilot is gone and they know no other deer are being brought in. Then those nearby hurry up and get the net back up because the pilot's already rounding up the next few deer to bring in. Speaking of the pilot, he's very good about only bringing in the deer they want, which in this case is does and fawns. An errant mature buck in the net isn't wanted at all because they can't be collared. But if caught, then you have a big animal with antlers that makes it even more dangerous to extract. When two more deer, a doe and a fawn were brought in, they came in closer to where I was hiding. While they didn't go into the nets in view of the camera, I ran down to see exactly what it was they were doing with the two deer just captured. The first thing they try to do is get a blindfold on the deer. That helps tremendously to calm them down. Then they move the deer out of the net. Some are easier than others, but this was an easy one. Now because of where this deer happened to be caught, they opted to move it, very carefully mind you, down to the bottom of the draw and away from the net. 
It took a bit of work, but we soon found ourselves free of all the nets and next to the doe's fawn, which was also caught by a few other volunteers. At this point, it was time to secure the deer. They used hobbles to secure all four legs together. It was actually the rear legs that were the most dangerous to get caught by, as they have a powerful kick. In fact, those that are holding the deer down while it's being hobbled have to hold it a specific way to keep it and those helping safe. The biggest thing to watch out for until hobbled are those powerful back legs. If it's done right, the deer can kick all at once, but it'll just be kicking into the air and no one gets injured. As they got started, I asked Curtis Hendricks to explain exactly what it was they do with each deer. We're going to radio collar this animal. That is actually going to track her movements. We have a GPS collar that'll give us really good location data. Um, the reason we're doing that is uh, twofold. Like I said, we're gonna get some habitat use, uh, dispersal data, uh, where she goes, what she uses in the summer, what she uses in the winter. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're gonna use this data a bunch to develop habitat use models for mule deer. Um, obviously when the collar doesn't move for a certain amount of time, uh, we know it's uh, either the collar shed or the animal's dead. Um, and then we'll immediately go out and try to ascertain the cause of death, which gives us an idea on, again, what the cause of mortality for this population is. Uh, things we're going to take, we're going to take some body measurements on her, a hind foot, a chest girth. Um, we're going to get a fat measurement to see what type of body condition she is um, right now. Uh, we'll also see whether or not we can tell if she's had a fawn. Uh, these are all kind of just some physiological um, uh, some physiolog physiological information we want to know. Obviously the fat measurement is going to tell us, uh, you know, her propensity for potentially surviving winter. Uh, and when we combine that, we'll get an overall feel for what the health of the population is. Um, other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take some blood here. We'll do a basic uh, disease uh, scan on blood. We can also get pregnancy rates off of that. I was surprised when they pulled out a cool ultrasound unit to make a few of the measurements. If I understood right, it was mainly used to measure the deer's fat reserves. The doe was also tagged with ear tags, one in each ear, as many times they fall off, and another for good measure on the collar itself. Meanwhile, Luke had a camera up the hill a bit where another group was working on a fawn and getting its weight, a strong indicator on how healthy it is going into winter. In fact, the pilot had brought so many in over the last 20 minutes that there were several groups working over deer. Each deer took about 20 minutes to get everything done that they needed. Luckily, there were several fishing game employees that had been trained on how to do this. With this doe finished up, it was taken to the opposite side of the net from where the pilot was driving them and then released, with several volunteers on hand to scare it away from the net so it wouldn't run back in. That doe was extremely strong, so it was quite an experience. As you can see, uh, what we're doing here today is a drive net operation. Uh, for our captures, we typically use, oh, three or four different techniques. Primarily, it's drive nets, uh, net gunning, uh, and darting for most of our capture efforts. And if you watch some of this footage, sometimes you might be going, holy heck, that seems like it could be hard on deer. Actually, drive netting is our best um, capture technique that we have. It tends to be the easiest on the deer. Uh, our uh, injury rates are extremely, extremely low. In fact, it's really rare if we actually have an injury associated with this capture technique. The other part that's really a benefit for us is a couple of things. Is number one, it gets uh, the public out a chance to interact and engage with you know their resources, their mule deer and elk herds. Um, the other part is, is it's the most cost effective for us. So you know every time, every minute those blades are turning, it's costing us dollars, and we want to be uh, as responsible in you know spending sportsman's dollars um, in the most efficient way. This is our most effective capture um, method that we have. So uh, yeah, there's if I was to choose one, this would be the one that I would prefer. Uh, but it doesn't landscape terrain, those sorts of things doesn't always lend itself. Uh, to drive nets um, based on either terrain, densities of deer, or those sorts of things. But uh, again, I think probably my favorite part is getting to watch um, people that I don't work with every day or folks who don't work for the department get to come out and actually, you know, engage uh, with wildlife. It's, it's the best part. And, you know, our groups, the big thing is, is we're never too busy to stop and take a picture or, you know, let somebody capture a memory or something like that. So uh, I love it. Best part of my job. There was so much action during this deer capture that I'm just going to let the video show you how it went. 
This curse was 97. Looking good, Ernie. <laughs> they can handle at once but I'll tell you what they are working deer above me below me to the side there's a lot of deer on the ground right now everybody's busy doing stuff at least those that have there are in the know and know what's going on super cool it was a little difficult trying to position my body the right way so I could hold her down but it was awesome well the helicopter made a pass and uh, not quite sure what happened we are down to the last hour or so of light and we just heard the wrap it up take everything down call so it's been a good day lots and lots of deer that were caught today I don't know how many they were hoping for but I'm pretty sure we exceeded uh, at least that number and uh, almost ran out of collars I think so now we gotta just tear everything down and get out of here before dark, but that was fun. It was pretty fun actually getting on top of them and being able to be part of the tagging and the collaring. So I hope I can do it again. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to the Jared Scott Outdoors YouTube channel.